totally physically mobile and everything, you know, if you're not physically mobile, like it's hard to get around and do stuff in this town. Um, okay, so we'll get back to these. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Um, we're not going to go through this too much, but again, just this idea that it's kind of like a dead end if you do not recognize these structures and try to change them or transform them because the energy just stops, right? The, the flow just stops. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but I know you're moving into design tonight. And so when you're looking at like an ecological design, for those of you who are into looking at social structure design, you can go through a similar process of you know thinking of the purpose and the mission and the needs of that group of people or society and kind of going through like who ownership and all the invisible structures under these different things, these scaffolding structures, labor input, decision making power. And all of a sudden you can really see like where the problems of inequity might be, where you might want to make design changes. So there is hope, um, and there's you know this concept in um, ecology about self-organizing, how then all of a sudden an emergent property happens where a whole new pattern develops, a whole new system. So all of you, as you go out in the world in your lives, right, observing, interacting, and then you observe again, and then the feedback is going to change the patterns. And so it's exciting to know that these are not set and that they will change and can be changed and we will change them. So how does this permeate the permaculture movement? I'm really just gonna be talking about the Northeast on this land. There's like many different conversations you'd have depending on where you are in this country or where you are in the world. Um, I only really know about the Northeast a bit. So basically, in, until recently, the main model in the permaculture movement was that you take a PDC, this permaculture design course that is between, you know, a week to two weeks it costs a good amount of money there's some financial aid but it's not a lot for everybody and you know who is assuming that everyone can take that amount of time off that you can go that you can um and so what's happened is it was like at the beginning a mostly white upper middle class tended to be heavy on the male gender participants and usually in areas where there was like a progressive hub um it didn't really address that the courses were occurring on unacknowledged stolen land. It wasn't addressing like the underlying traumas that everyone is still navigating and trying to figure out how to heal and integrate and recognize and identify. Um, underlying racism, sexism, classism, and all the other isms that could be there that go along with that. Um, often was not happening in inner city communities, poor rural communities. There's many other communities that just wasn't um, being offered in. Also not recognizing the inherent solidarity with all the other peoples that are, you know, needing this, pretty much every being on the planet, <laughs> um, that it can help. And then also the enduring indigenous knowledge, because before permaculture, right, I mean, indigenous people, since the beginning of humanity have been practicing this. You know, permaculture is a term that was coined, but we know that this is like people who have been living close to the earth since the beginning of our species have been practicing it you know in various forms so that's kind of the pattern originally and people started recognizing that and one example in the northeast is there was a group pine it transforms to a group pan there's a you can click on this um, link i think we might share the um, powerpoint with you it's a really neat organization called pan and they it's really dedicated to increasing the resilience of the northeast region strengthening the permaculture network and um, increasing access to relevant um, education and resources. So what we're going to do briefly is, did everyone get, we're going to hand this pledge out. And we could just have um, one or two groups from uh, who identified uh, places where these scaffolding and visible structures were addressed in this effect, in effectively or not effectively. Anyone want to discuss that? Groups that I think that was the first few rows. You want to share what you saw? What do you think that they? Yes. I want to work in general on these expectations. I'm sure everyone has different expectations of what they want to get out of it, whether they're like actually farming or they want to have like a better backyard. So it varies so much. And you saw that this did or did not address that? It was addressed. It was, it was addressed. addressed. Okay. 
Great. Anyone else that saw where invisible structures were addressed in this? Yes. Um, the, I think it was the fourth one down where it says conduct the classroom as a safe space for learning and we don't need to discriminate based on race, gender, and sexual orientation, stuff like that. Yeah. Like addressing the whole incapability uh, problems or the race problems or gender problems, stuff like that. So I think everyone involved. Great. Yeah. And so, the, and there would be a lot too, teachers making sure that they're doing that in a way for everybody. That's an excellent one. Where did anybody see that invisible structures were not addressed? Or where? Yes. In that same sentence, I feel like you could have put age in. Mm -hmm. um, in like both ways, like you're never too young to start learning about those healthy principles, but also like you're never too old. Great. So adding age to that, that's great. And this actually good because this feedback can go to the people who crafted this. Um, I helped craft it, but the people you saw and inhabit, a lot of them did. Yes. <clears throat> um, they mentioned sharing like the syllabus and the daily schedule on teachers' qualifications online, but they don't address people that might not have media access. That's a big one, assuming that everyone has, right. Great. So paper copies, right? Or... Yes. Um, I found it interesting that like they were interested in exploring like how to make people accountable and when they do sign this pledge. But this seemed very in line with like most mission statements that like general companies have. Mainly I think because it's like said in law that you can't like discriminate by age. You should, like you're not allowed to do those things and you'll get in trouble if you do them. But it, the, I think the accountability aspect wasn't addressed as much as it could. Okay. Like making sure that those like that the, the things that they listed here are actually being taken into like like they're act, they're actually being employed. You know? So maybe like a specific example. Or something. something, yeah. Yeah, something know. more. Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Go along with that, like some form of training, like diversity training. Yeah. Yes, that that would be required to be in it. Yes. For the instructors. Yes. And further going off of that, um, like sure anyone can make a pledge or say maybe like what say like an interviewer an interviewer wants to hear but is it authentic are those actually their values um mm -hmm. and then also something that was missing off the fourth bullet was religion and how that might affect practices or what's being taught that's a big one excellent any last comments yes uh i just thought it was kind of interesting in their wording in the first paragraph they said that um, clarifies expectations of permanent culture, whatever, whatever, to know that teachers that sign this pledge honor and are committed to these practices, that kind of in itself creates like a power divide between people that have signed this and people that haven't. So and sort of right creating right? an invisible structure, like you should go with these people or not those people because they haven't signed this. So that's excellent because that came up at the meeting is they're like, well, we're just recreating the same thing and now it's a whole new elite system that's more whatever than the other one. Do you, did, did anyone come up with a statement? Do you have a way that that could be worded that wouldn't create that dynamic? I did not come up with a good way to say it. Yeah. So. That's a good living question. Yeah. Yes. Our other concern was with like your level of education and if they're using accessible language. Mm -hmm. It's kind of been alluded to in a few spots, like they'll have interpreters or translators and like the classrooms are safe spaces to learn. But like they never really address like maybe people who like dropped out of high school or people who made it through college and have their masters. Like what's kind of the level of like teaching here? Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Great. Okay, so this is a really amazing tool, and um, if you go on the Pan website, there's actually a link where feedback could be given. So feel free to give feedback. This is kind of like a living document. So I, I'm actually gonna email Lisa when I get home and share some of this. This is awesome because this is really important and we need to keep improving continually, right? So it's like a self-organizing system. It's finding a new level of symmetry. So I'm just gonna go really quickly through these because I wanna make sure that Alyssa has time to cover some of the economic structures. So forgive me, it's a little speedy. You will have a link to this to go back through. Real brief, community land trust movement. Again, we're talking about like Western 
society, indigenous people had this concept in a much more evolved form than what we're trying to do, but this idea based on um, genomics, which this man wrote 1879 in a book called Progress and Poverty, basically that humans, um, anything that is from nature is really to be shared by all. So land trust movement tries to work towards that. Now, what's not addressed is like, we're on Abenaki land right now, right? And um, how about all of the people who, because they're not here, our society is benefiting from the privilege of getting to be here. So this is really exciting to me that's been developing a land reparation tax. And so basically, um, I, I'm not gonna click on these right now, but you can click on them. And one of them is uh, a land tax. If you live anywhere in a certain area near San Francisco, it identifies all the areas and the tribes that were displaced and they enter your rent and that will tell you how much to pay per month would be like a equitable amount that goes to these tribes that then supports them for building their you know, cultural center and other parts of their culture thriving. Um, similarly, in Seattle, they have this real rent where it's a different form of this tax. Yes? How is a tax like that collected? <clears throat> um, well, I think, and if you look on the link, it, there's a PayPal, and there's a couple of different ways, and it goes directly to an organization of the tribe, and then they distribute it. Yeah. So it's like I didn't, self employed, like you're choosing to pay that. Pay yes, this is not pay. institutional, it's a bottom up, um, it's by choice. And there is a group in Vermont, we're hoping to introduce this. Um, and this would be amazing. This is just a step, right? There's a long way to go. So real briefly in Vermont, a couple of examples of rewiring social structures. I'm part of a group called Dawnland Decolonization. And um, it's not linking, but there is an event coming up in Montpellier. Um, and it's an amazing event where you're going to read all these texts with people that are about what does it mean to be a, like a settler on stolen land. And those people who have that identity, how do you navigate that? How do you be conscious and humble with it? And how do you work that through? And so um, look, you can look up the Everything Space in Montpelier. And also on Facebook, we have an event. And again, you can click on this link. So it's a great group. Um, another project of uh, Fred Wiseman, um, really brilliant Abenaki man who's a scholar and a writer and a seed saver, has been gathering Abenaki seeds and every year he's distributing the people to grow so there's more and more of the original Abenaki seeds and he you know did a workshop a little while ago about Abenaki gardening which is like the pre-permaculture in Vermont um, and he has workshops all over the Northeast. Abenaki Artists Association, another great link you can um, link on. I took a workshop with them and they teach educators how to teach about Abenaki history from a non-colonial perspective. You know, for example, Community College of Vermont, when I taught Natural History of Vermont, it did not have any essential objectives, anything about the Native Americans. And a lot of the books we read started with the colonial era, right? That's a big problem. So this organization, um, among other things they do, do amazing arts and crafts and teach them. They also help train educators um, and bring curriculum into the public schools and institutions. Black Lives Matter Greater Burlington, amazing organization trying to work on you know, creating racial equity in the community and helping bridges with people. And they, one of the neat things about this group is they have um, connected to the National Black Lives Matter movement, but they also have two additional principles about leadership and healing, and they have a caucus of people of color and a caucus of white people that work separately and then together knowing that each group is working through their own issues. So it's a really well thought out, um, brilliant group of people really working for social change. And there's ways to get involved. This link you can click in and join. Um, they're always looking for folks to join. And then also there is um, Justice for All, an amazing organization centered in Burlington and Montpelier that's working on changing the laws. So I mentioned laws about institutionalized racism, as we know that you know there's a lot of laws that are really problematic and they're actually right now there's two bills that are being thrown around on the legislative floor they're working on pushing that through you can all be part of that by writing letters um and then migrant justice you know amazing organization that's really working on building the voice capacity and farm um power of the farmer the farm worker community and um really working to organize for economic justice and human rights and there's many other groups but these are just some examples so Burlington Permaculture, feel free to join. 
If you're not on, if you are on Facebook, you can join through Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, you can come to an event and sign up on the email. And if you don't have a computer, let us know and we can give you a phone call. Um, we have a lot of events. We've had all of these um, educational workshops. There's one coming up on greenhouse building if anyone wants to go. If you want to, if you have a project, you want people to come, we have a permablitz network that's connected to a bigger permablitz network and you sign up and fill out this application and people show up with shovels and help out. And then the neat thing is this uh, group has recently gotten a grant from New England Grassroots Environmental Fund with the intention that we're going to bring permaculture to the parts of Burlington that don't normally um, have it exposed, right? Because there's a lot of inner city parts of Burlington, a lot of um, new Americans, a lot of places where they might have it in their own version, but kind of building bridges and sharing and all um, linking up together. I'm not going to get into these theories right now, except to say the main theory is about sharing and that the more we share, the more we are going to relook at these ideas of private property and these ideas of invisible structures and that there's still an ability to have your own space and your own whatevers but that the sharing helps kind of shift your reference and how nutrient exchange, how they move around. And you can look at these later, and there's many, but I picked these out because I think they're pretty, pretty interesting. And just this quote about utopias that um, I invite you all, and I imagine many of you in your past already have and currently are, living in various uh, social structures and trying out different things, because when you do that, and then say you decide to go back in society and be a contributing member, you're gonna really bring in things that are gonna transform it. Sometimes we need to taste it for a while and really like live it and kind of shed some of the old patterns that we've you know, been conditioned in before we can actually embody it and then bring it into places where maybe people around us don't know about it and kind of gently communicate and help them realize it too. So I invite you all to enjoy that opportunity, and I know many of you are already doing that, of living in various, working in different social structures. And then finally, I know you've been learning or will learn about microclimates, these areas you know, on land where maybe the sun shines longer or the snow hangs longer, and just looking in your own individual lives, even if it's just like in a relationship you have with one family member or one part of your financial framework of what little tweaks you can do to liberate yourself from um, some of these structures that might be preventing flow of energy. So, Alyssa is now going to